if you can understand this, that not only does this how breakthroughs occur, but this is the secret to making consistently really exciting work that changes so fast that collectors notice differences and like, my God, this is so different when you just did. So today I want to talk about breakthroughs and how to set the conditions for those to occur in your work. We don't often think about how to do this, but we all want it. We all want those fast developments with those fast discoveries that we weren't expecting. That's really what we're after, but we don't talk a lot about it. We just kind of hope and we wait around and we think if we just do the normal thing, something's gonna happen. And for the most part, that's true, but it can take a long time for things to shift. And if you're like me, you wanna, you wanna go quick. You wanna, you want it to be exciting. You wanna progress. You wanna go further, faster. And this new year coming up, you know, how, how can that happen? How can this be the year that your art gets to an entirely cool, new, exciting place? So I just thought I would talk about what I've been thinking about for myself around this idea of breakthroughs. Welcome to Art to Light, a podcast for the creatively curious. My name is Nicholas Wilton, and each week I'll help you rediscover not just the art of your life, but the art in your life. Join me as we explore that perfect blue at twilight, the wild frontiers of art making, and the extraordinary joy of finding your way as you go. A breakthrough is defined as, and I looked it up, as a sudden, dramatic, and important discovery or development. It doesn't say a lot about how to get these, but I don't really think of it that way. <laughs> so I feel like all the information, all the important things that we need to learn, the next steps, the things that matter are kind of waiting for us, that we have a better sense of what these are than we think. That our intuition, the innermost part of ourselves already knows what the next steps are gonna be, what the next cool thing is. We already, we already know that, but we're so busy and we have such a limited way. We're trying to think our way through all of this. And if we can slow down a little bit, if we can come at the answer or listen in a new way, I think the more sort of higher place in ourselves, the wiser part of ourselves, the soul, if you want to call it that, will get through. And when it does <laughs> and we hear it, then that's a breakthrough. And it makes sense, this idea of it, because you know when you're stressed out, nothing magical happens, no advancements occur. <laughs> you know, you're just running around, putting out fires. It's because you don't have time to listen. You don't have time to pay attention. So a lot of what I'm talking about today is different ways of paying attention to yourself and seeding, seeding the conditions for something amazing to occur in your art. So that's important, right? To realize that when push comes to shove, we just stay in our normal pattern, if it's successful, especially. If there's things that we do that are kind of working, we'll just keep doing it. You know, we're hardwired for certainty. We just keep doing the same thing. And it's that habitual way of being that keeps us on the same kind of outcomes, keeps us at the same amount kind of, the learning slows down and we don't get those big, huge realization. So that's the first thing. Just. Think about breakthroughs as they're already preloaded. You come with them. They're all there. They're all waiting. You know, the next one and the one after that, the one after that. I love thinking about it like that because it gets me really, really curious. You know, like, what is the next thing I, I need to learn? Like, what's going to trigger it? What's going to happen? And it kind of keeps it in the forefront. It's not this strike of lightning that comes out of nowhere and, and hits you and suddenly you've made an amazing progress. So the next idea that I want to talk about is just, and I've spoken about this before on, on the, actually the last episode around this question of 
that all artists ask themselves based on what I've made, what I, the evidence of what's around me, what I just created, whether it's a sculpture or photography or paintings, and you lay these things out in front of you and you look at them and then you ask yourself, looking at this, being me, having just done this, what is the next, the next best step for me? What do I do next? And it is not a question you can answer without having created something, right? So of course, of course, breakthroughs are not going to occur unless you get in motion. You have to be involved in creating something, right? But that question is important to ask and it's really important to hold. To hold not just when you're in the studio, uh, not just when you're, you know, mixing up the paint or while making, but to be carrying it with you all the time. What is the next step? What is the next step for me? You know, we're looking for that, that challenge solution. You know, here's the challenge. What is the solution? We're looking for that all the time. And because if you can extend that question, not just to your art, but it's just a question that's in your life that you're, that's close to the surface, then things come across your path in your life that relate to it that you notice that are just a little more colorful than other things. And this is what we want to look out for. Clues will pop up and it's a complete mystery. It's people call it synchronicity, but I think it's like an awareness. You know, people talk about seeing 1111 all the time. And I've done that when I start thinking about 1111, I see it all the time, you know, just because I'm thinking about it. It's just like every time I look at my damn iPhone, it says 1111. That's a real thing. And, and I, you know, and I don't know if it's magically happening or is, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that I'm thinking about it and I notice it. So carrying that question, and you don't need to know the answer. That's the beautiful part about this, that it's just that question. You're carrying it through your day. And then here's what I do with this, because I forget, but I'll notice things. And the fastest way I have found to grab them, because usually I'm running or I'm walking or I'm in conversation with someone, I'm out in the world doing something, usually several things at the same time. I'm driving and I'm listening to the thing. I use the app on my phone, the little notes thing, you know, it's super simple. And I just have, I just put down a couple words that relate to it. And I'm doing this all the time, by the way. And I don't, I don't, I just know that I just, there's something about that and I don't have time to figure it out, but I just notate it. So that's my first touch on it, but you gotta grab it. Otherwise it's gone. It's kind of like a dream. If you don't write it down, um, you'll never remember it in the morning. You know, it's like if there was something, you know, you get a deja vu, but if you just make a little note of what that thing is, it might be a color, it might be a story, it might be something somebody said. Sometimes it's a thing that you wanna go to. And then when you go to the thing, it, it provides all kinds of, clarity for you, you know, like, well, that just sounds like something I need to go to, or this person sounds really interesting. I'm listening to the radio. I'm going to go buy their book. Sometimes I'll just buy the book just on the hunch that it's something important. And the book comes, I can't even remember why I bought it, but then I'll read it. And then later, you know, it could be the summer later, I'll be like, oh my God, thank God I got this. And this is what I'll do. So I'll write these little notes down. But then you gotta go back and you gotta record them in a way that you can remember them. So you've touched it once, you've pulled it out of your life, you've touched it once and that drops it in so you remember it. And then you have to go back to it. And I, this is just what I do, I take it or leave it. I'll take those little reminders and I'll put them in a journal under creativity or under inspiration or where, where I can see them again. And I write it out. I write it out in a, you know, it's just a couple sentences and what that means to me. Like, here's one. I heard a thing on the radio and they were talking about the Mona Lisa, the, the painting, right? And the model, the, the woman who that he painted, it's all like, why is this painting? You know, why when you go to the Louvre in, in Paris and there's thousands of people lining up. I've seen this painting. You, it's like an event. You can't even get up close to it. There's so many people waiting to stand in front of it. And it's behind a glass case and everything, you know, and it's like, well, what is, 
what is it about this painting? And I remember thinking a lot about that when I saw it, you know, and I waited in line to see it and everything. It's like, what, what's going on here? And I don't know, you know, it's not like, there's something about her expression, that for sure. And it has to do with her smile. And that was kind of as far as I got. But later I heard this uh, conversation about it. I don't know if it's true or not, but the story goes that she had recently lost a child and was just completely heartbroken, you know, the model. So she was, she was destroyed, you know, she was just so crestfallen from this experience and so much, so much sadness. But then she had given birth more recently to another child and was so, so happy, you know, like the joy, it came true and it, it, it sort of made up for this you know, this sad part, but it was, and she was so happy, but she didn't feel it was truthful to be completely beaming from ear to ear about this. And she felt so much joy, but she also held the sadness of what had happened. So that smile that she has is so complex and it's so beautiful because it holds, well, it holds truthfulness, really. The truth was, is it's complicated and it's not simple. But, you know, I thought a lot about that and, and I just love the power. Like what that means is that here's this challenging emotional experience that she is sharing with all of us <laughs> years later, hundreds of years later. And it teaches us that truthfulness is so, so powerful. That's why all these people are, even though it's complicated, even though we don't necessarily want to feel sadness, that we need to hold that. Like, it's good to hold that. And actually, we connect to that. Look at all the people that look at this painting. And, you know, it's changed lives after it was made and people line up for it. And it's the most famous painting in the entire world. That was just a little quip on a radio show that I heard and I, I didn't really think about it. I just thought it was interesting because I had thought about it before and I wrote it down. But then when I went back and I kind of wrote it out a little bit and started thinking more about it. And that gave me some ideas around my own art making that it's OK to have it be hard and it's OK to leave some of the work not done very well. Because some of it is really, really successful and really confident and other parts I'm not so sure about. And I used to try to make it all look confident and all perfect. And I don't think it makes a great, as great a painting. I mean, I think people can feel in your work what it is you're going through. Like they can feel that. They can't even, it's a mystery why that painting is so amazing, but there's something clearly. And that idea has really changed my art. It's given me a lot more confidence around being more of a human being when I'm making my art and showing more of myself and having it be more complete, although not so perfect view of myself and, and what, I'm, what I'm trying to do. So I think that's something that, you know, these are the clues that come out. And, and if you're asking yourself the question, like my question of, what do I do next and how can I make my art better? Which is sort of always my question, like given where I've done, what can I do next? That was a really powerful answer that I took, that I changed, right? So just never fully leaving your practice by carrying that question around is kind of the second idea here to seeding a breakthrough, you know, to seeding something that's really, really gonna make a difference and change your work in a dramatic way. The other idea is around vision and having one, <laughs> even if you don't know necessarily what it is. What I discover with visions are that they're kind of scary to say, to declare, because we are, for myself, I'm afraid they might not happen. And that somehow makes you less than. But the notes I have on this are, you know, declare it. You know, declare your audacious vision. What do you want this work to feel like? Where does it want to go next year? What is the feeling of this work that you could 
If you could wave a magic wand, would happen? What would it feel like? How would you feel when you make it? So it's really something that you have to think about. This isn't even something that you're doing. This is something you're thinking about before you're making your work. Now, you have to be looking at the work you've made and, and getting a sense of where you want to take it. So I usually think about this a lot at the end of the year because I'm looking at next year and what I want to feel like. Really, it's what I want to feel like in my art making, which is also my life. And what I do is I write down the word or phrase and I put it on my wall. And I can change it. It doesn't have to be always the same, but usually I go with something and I declare it. And I will write it on the wall in my studio so I see it when I'm working. This year, my word is ease. It's how I want to feel. It's how I want the art to feel. I don't want it to feel easy, but I want it to feel like there's a comfort in the discomfort. So there's spaciousness, and then this is just in my own head. This is how I'm thinking about it. So for example, I'll write that on my wall. And when I'm making my art, I check it against that word. And here's the thing, you know, you really have to decide ahead of time, you know, what this is going to be. And nothing else will suffice. You have to be kind of brave with this or just really strict because the tendency to just do what you're pretty good at is always there. You can always do that. So you have to be able to say, double check, does this feel that way? And know that if it isn't, you got to change it. It's like, this will not be good if it doesn't feel like that. You have to be kind of disciplined with this. And, you know, we're, we're looking for a big thing to occur here. It, so it makes sense that you're going to have to do something differently. And so this is a bar. You're declaring something <laughs> and you're putting it out for the world to see and you're carrying it and you're looking at it and you're double checking what you make. Then the question becomes, how do I get this so there's more ease in this? Or maybe it's, you know, spontaneity, you know, how can I be more spontaneous? That's always on the tip of your tongue. So that's what you're tending towards that all the time. And it's just a fast way to have this arrive. You know, breakthroughs come because we're ready for them. It's, they don't just kind of happen by accident all the time. You have to be able, you've got to be like prime for this. <laughs> so knowing that, knowing that phrase or that word of what you're kind of after, even if it's kind of close, but not even entirely accurately, you can get something that's closer than nothing. Right. So don't don't get stuck on this. And it's like, well, I don't even know. Just get close because this is just a progression. Guess what? In six months, this is going to change. Right. So you're just evolving. You're just moving closer and closer to what it is you want your work to feel like what that vision you have for it. And nobody can help you with this. That's the crazy thing. You can talk about it to other people, but it's only your vision based on the things you've done before. And what's the next logical step? That question, based on what I've done before, what's the next best step for me? And it's crazy because it's different for everybody. And that's the beautiful thing. Your vision is completely different and it's going to have a completely different look. And that's what we want. We want personal, authentic work. This vision comes out of you. It's a shorthand thing that represents who you are and what you're after and it's totally current. And then, then when the work feels like that, it becomes incredibly seductive for other people because it's really different and it's something that nobody's seen before, which is the big currency, you know, in, in fine art, in making things and creating things. It's what we all crave. We want to see you. We want to see who you are and give us confidences so we can express who we are by you sharing who you are and that you can make something that is personal and authentic and truthful. So declaring that vision is a big, huge part of it. So that's a, a real simple thing you can do. And it has 
powerful kind of results. And then to know ahead of time. Next idea is, is around knowing that leading up to the breakthrough should feel different in your art making. That you're asking, it's a big ask, that you want to have something occur. And so how do we make it feel different? And it has to do with risk. It's riskier. You just got to know that going in, that you've got to up the level of the risk in order for this kind of breakthroughs to occur, for big progress. Risk taking is the most underutilized strategy that I see out there. You know, and I work with a lot of artists and I talk to a lot of artists and I coach a lot of artists and it's almost always connected to risk and the lack of it. So that's important to just get that, to do that bigger move, to use something or do something in a way that you haven't before. And that's going to feel, that's going to feel uncertain and that's going to put you on the edge of your seat a little bit. But it's just garden variety risk. It just, it's, if you can understand this, that not only does this have breakthroughs occur, but this is the secret to making consistently really exciting work that changes so fast that collectors notice differences and like, my God, this is so different when you just did. Wow. You know, like, it's like a watching an amazing movie when different themes occur and, and different things happen in this movie. It's, it's riveting. It's fascinating. You want the journey of your art making to look really cool and to, for you mostly, but also from the outside, the, the artifact of it, all that art you're making should show a progression, you know, and, it, and that's shown through risk taking because you don't know what you're going to do, you know, and really we're just up leveling that. We're just up leveling the fact, you know, we're giving ourselves some certainty about this is what it wants to feel like. This is what it wants to look like. This is, so I'm holding that. And at the same time, I'm letting go of control also, and I'm willing to risk. I'm willing to risk, you know, we're so hardwired for certainty, but that is the opposite. That won't create doing the same thing over and over and over. It's really hard to gain a new insight from that, to get some remarkable breakthrough or discovery because it's predictable and you get your human animal kind of goes to sleep a little. You're asleep at the wheel a little. We want to be alert on the edge of our seats and be ready to be ready for this. And risk is what does it. It's what wakes you up. And it's not that risky because it's not like you're risking your life. You're just going out on the skinny branches of yourself and be willing to feel vulnerable and be willing to maybe try something that might not work out, which you can just repaint or rechange or do. But just to know that not only is this a great breakthrough strategy, but it's just a great strategy for making amazing incredible art consistently. And it's what I'm often a cheerleader for with people and helping them get their art to the next level. I'm just like reminding them of that and saying, you got to do this and it's fine. And don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And then it goes and then it occurs, right? Breakthroughs occur for all these reasons. Like we're just seeding, we're just optimizing the practice, optimizing you for this to occur. And another cool way to think about this is that you're going to do the same kind of thing. You know, it's not like you've got to completely change everything. You have an interest. You've been doing something for a while, probably. It's not like you've got to completely change a style or anything, but you can simply change the way you get there, right? So you can change the tools you use to make your art. I know for me, I... You know, I love oil paint, I love paint, and I can make any color I want, and why mess with that? But when I started using oil pastels, in addition to oil sticks, there was something about that tool, this big crayon, that allowed a kind of immediacy that it so changed my work. I feel so different using that tool, even though I can make that color in oil paint, I can create the same kind of color, but there's something about picking something up and immediately making a mark and putting it down. And it's just so quick. 
And that changed my work. That brought an immediacy and a, and a kind of boldness to it that I was asking for, which that year, I remember that year, it was like, oh, there was a wildness was what I wanted. Untamed was the word. And I remember, and that's what I was looking for. And then when I noticed using this, I'm always trying different materials. It gave me that feeling. It was like, that's it. That's, I want that feeling. You know, and so it was just that was a perfect example of something that came in because I had that word on the wall. It's like that is truly kind of out of control in a really cool way. That mark and and I can close my eyes and it's like a paintbrush. You run out of paint and you got to go back and put more on it. But with an oil pastel, it's like eight inches and it's super thick and you can just draw all over the painting. And you don't have to stop and you can just really warm up and go crazy with it. <laughs> that was a game changer. So think about that. Do the same thing, but just come to it in a different direction. You know, put the painting upside down, right? You know, put it upside, work on it half the time in the beginning, upside down. I have these large paintings that I work on and sometimes I need a stool. And I notice that when I'm on a stool, I can't reach I make a different kind of mark when I'm on a stool because I'm kind of reaching. There's just something about being up in the air when I do it. So, and I like that. I like that feeling. So I started using a stool, but on smaller paintings and I hung them higher up in my studio. So I had to use a stool to get to the top part. And it was something about, I think it was because I was on a stool and I was high up and I was close to it. And then I had to get down. There was something about that that just made it, it made it more interesting. It made it fresher. And I made marks in a different way. I use a timer and I've talked a lot about this in the Creative Visionary Program. Um, you know, one of the, it's sort of a hack that your brain can do stuff so quickly if you're just willing to say go <laughs> and okay, do it now, go. We have incredible success at these workshops we teach, you know, when they're in person and we use, we play three songs and people work twice as large. And, you know, I, we talk about it ahead of time. We're going to be bold and we're going to work quickly and don't think about it and just listen to the music and go for it. And so often the work that people do in 10 minutes is some of the best work they've made in the whole workshop. And they've spent hours on these things. There's something about that, that when you get your head out of it, when you get your head out of the thinking mode and you're just letting this come through you, it's really, the marks are more powerful. The work is more powerful. And this is where the breakthroughs occur. You know, that place is where there's higher energy. So I use a timer every time I work because it's like, I only have an hour and I'm, I'm this is it. I am gonna paint like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> and it's really a cool thing. What happens, it's better. It's just better than if I have all day, you know? And it's like, I don't wanna just, I wanna do strong work and I wanna do it quick and I wanna enjoy it. I wanna be in an energized place. And I think sort of wrapping this all up, this is what we're after. This is, this is the cool thing, is that we gotta optimize our energy. You know, we optimize our energy by, by having a word that we can touch to and say, hell no, like I'm not stopping, I want that. Or I only have 30 minutes, 20 minutes, I'm just going for it, I'm gonna take a risk. When you feel that, when you have that energy and you don't know what's gonna happen next, that's when all the amazing, all the amazing things occur in the work because you're on the edge of your seats. And that, that is art making. And if, if I could wave a magic wand for everyone on listening to this, myself included, the more moments in our life, the more time we have when we feel this way, the better. It's really what we're after. And the results, the artifact, which is so cool about art making, we can, if we can balance this, that our art making can show that. And then people can experience it also when they see that work. And that's the gift, you know, the gift. It's not just for us. It's for everyone who experiences our work. So anyway, I hope this was helpful and, and that more energy is coming for you and breakthroughs and a huge amount of progress for the new year. 
give it some thought, you know, give it some thought and maybe leave in the comments. Um, you can go to arttolife.com and click on podcast. There's a place to comment and post your word in there. You know, what, what is it going to be this year? I'd be super curious to hear that. Listen, I have a, a pretty cool uh, Color Tips PDF you can get at colortipspdf.com. It's some information about color that I think could be really helpful. People are having a lot of success with this and getting a lot of positive comments. So I'm just uh, offering that for those of you who are new here. If this was cool, share it with your friends. This episode, I would be so great. And leave a review, that would be even better. Thanks a lot. I will talk to you soon. Okay. Hey, thanks for listening to the Art to Life show. If you enjoyed the podcast, please help me get the word out by sharing it with your friends on Instagram at art to life underscore world. The recording of this and all episodes, along with a place to leave comments, see additional photos, and discover a whole new approach to making art can be found by going to arttolifepodcast.com. And secondly, if you could leave a rating and review and Whatever app you're listening on today, I would super, super appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And last but not least, before you go, if you'd like to be on my artist list, every Sunday morning I send out a video blog all about art making. Go to arttolifepodcast.com to sign up. And all these links are in the show notes, of course. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week. Bye.